people have given up on immigration. They're just waiting to see what happens. And, 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 and I can't give up. I've got all these employees who have families and, and, and I can't give up for the kids. My name is Linda Laurel, and I'm asking you to have the courage to listen with an open mind to all of our voices, because our voices matter. I want to take a moment to thank BMW of West Houston for sponsoring this episode of our Voices Matter podcast. BMW, of course, is known as the ultimate driving machine because of its precision and power. As someone who has driven a BMW for many years now, I can attest to that firsthand. But I think what's even more important, especially about this particular BMW dealership, is that it understands the power and the impact of giving back to its community. BMW of West Houston is known for its support of countless local charities, and that is important to us here at Our Voices Matter podcast. So if you choose to do business with BMW of West Houston, not only will you be getting the stellar first-class service that the dealership is known for, but you can also rest assured that you are doing business with a dealership that truly cares about and gives back to its community. Hey, everybody, it's Linda Laurel. Thanks so much for tuning in for another episode of Our Voices Matter podcast. My guest today is Stan Merrick, president and CEO of the Merrick family of companies, one of the largest interior contractors in the Southwest. Stan is a Texas native and a graduate of Texas A&M University. He's the co-founder of Texans for a Sensible Immigration Policy, and he's a member of the Greater Houston Partnerships Task Force, Americans for Immigration Reform. Yes, you guessed it. Our topic today is immigration. As someone in the construction industry and who has personally and through his family employed thousands and thousands of people in the industry, many of whom are immigrants, Stan has an inside, up-close, personal look at the impact and the importance of comprehensive immigration reform. He's co-author of a book entitled Deconstructed, An Insider's View of Illegal Immigration and the Building Trades. Stan has a lot to say on this topic, and he offers us some solutions as well. So enjoy my conversation now with Stan Merrick. So Stan Merrick, it is wonderful to have you on our Voices Matter podcast. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on the show. My pleasure, Linda. Well, um, so there's a lot that I want to talk to you about. But of course, you know, you're the CEO of, of Merrick Family of Companies in the construction industry here in Houston. Um, But I want you to tell our audience why um, immigration is your issue. It is something that you have devoted so much of your life to. And it's such a, um, a, a difficult topic to talk about now because it's got so many uh, people on either side of the, of the equation, if you will. So tell us why is immigration so important to you, Stan Merrick? Well, con- construction has always been you know, performed by usually first generation Americans. You know, you had the Irish uh, in New York, you had the Chinese building the railroads. You, 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 you know, we had in, in Houston back in the 50s, right after WW2, it was the farm boys, the Czechs, the Poles, the Germans, like my dad and his brothers that came off the farm to do the construction. Uh, in, in the 70s and 80s, it was the Latino population. And uh, we needed them. We, we, we couldn't have built Texas or the United States without immigrant workers. I mean, it's just it's a fact. And, uh, and there are a lot of native, you know, other people that go into construction as well. But the hard stuff, you know, the roofing, the concrete, the drywall that really takes a lot of physical labor. You don't have a lot of kids wanting to go into that. And, uh, and, and, and you know, and we have not as an industry made it very attractive. Uh, the, the wages have not kept up with you know, uh, inflation through the years, and that's another subject entirely. But back to immigrants and why immigration is so important. Up until 1986, the Immigration Reform Act, we knew we had undocumented people in our country. President Reagan knew three and a half million, he estimated. And he, he and others in Congress passed the Immigration Reform Act of 86 and said, you know, if you um, you can get, it's a path to, to amnesty, a path to legal status, to citizenship. And it was, you know, learning English and taking some courses, 
paying a fee, and in less than 600,000 people did that because they figured out they could go, they were getting a Texas driver's license and they could get a, a, a social security card at the flea market that was better than the cars that we started issuing in, I think, 1938 or whatever it was. And, and so we had a lot of illegal people even after the Reform Act of, of 1986 because it's just no enforcement, nobody was gonna do anything about it and, and people were working. After 9-11, and, and the Department of Homeland Security taking over, they started tightening the screws on the immigrants. And uh, you know, then they were doing audits where they would come into companies like mine and they'd want to see what's called the I-9, which anybody that has employees has to fill out by law, social security card and ID. And most people had Texas driver's license and, and they had a, a ID that, I mean, a social security card that was maybe somebody else's number. And for years, they have been paying into social security, which because they were illegal, they would never get. And, and everybody knew that the government was getting, they estimated six billion a year in social security payments that were helping to shore up a system that was paying out more than it was getting in. And, but the Homeland Security and their ultimate wisdom said, well, we're gonna do these audits and, and they came into companies. And if you had people who were illegal, who were using a fake social, even though they had a Texas driver's license, you had to turn. So, so what you're saying is that the system is not designed in such a way that um, immigrants can, can, can have the kind of work that they need to have a living wage, et cetera. Um, and then also pay their, their fair share if they had legal status. Yeah, right now they can't. But what happened with with that, Linda, was when they came to an employer and said these people can't work for you because they're undocumented. They didn't deport these people. Not that they should have. That would be. But they said, okay, you go to work for somebody else. <laughs> now that's just saying you go to work for somebody else. That's not going to call you an employee. They're going to call you an independent subcontractor or. They're, you know, they're going to yeah. pay you cash. So, so let's let's put it. Let's try to put a face on this, okay? Because I know, okay. as an employer, you know, you have employed, you know, probably hundreds of thousands in, in your career, you and your family over the eighty-five year history of, of your company, um, your family of companies. So, give us a snapshot of of, of a story um, of somebody who has come through this system in a way that illustrates what it is that you're trying to. Yeah, well, here's here's a good Hector. Hector, I'm gonna give his last name. Worked for me 20, 25 years. Three American-born kids. He was from Honduras, and uh, he he never had an opportunity to get legal. And and maybe even in '86, he didn't take the opportunity to get legal, which is shame on him. But he was making about sixty-five thousand dollars a year as one of my top f foremen, and. Uh, but he had someone else's social security number and we have hospitalization for our employees. So when uh, Blue Cross gets Hector's in, uh, you know, uh, enrollment, they say, wait a minute, Hector's got so-and-so social security number with one of our other clients in Philadelphia. And, and, and then, I, then I have constructive knowledge. So I go to Hector, I say, Hector, what is this? He said, boss, I'm sorry. You know, I, I just never could get legal. and. My wife's legal, my kids are legal. And, and I said, well, Hector, I gotta let you go. And he said, oh, come on. He said, I, said, I, 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 I know. I mean, ICE is, you know, they, they've knocked on our door before. They, they wanna check these things. And if I have constructive knowledge, I don't have a choice. They've been several like Hector. So Hector, you know, he's not gonna get deported. He's gonna go find something else to do, working for one of my competitors. So he, but because he's illegal and, and, and the word gets out pretty fast in the construction industry, when somebody comes knocking on your door, and you're a good guy, they, they pretty well. So, okay, Hector, we'll put you to work as a as a subcontractor, like an Uber driver. So we're gonna send you 1099 and you don't, by the way, you lose your workman's comp. And if you get hurt, go to the emergency room because we don't provide workman's comp. This is a, another one of my competitors. And, and you know, you're not gonna have 40K, 401k with me. You're gonna work 60 hours a week and you're not gonna get paid overtime. And, and, and so this is what I have to compete against. I have to compete against not only people that don't do it right, but my ex-employees <laughs> who are great workers, and, and, it, and this happened dozens yeah. of times. So, Linda, you know, fast forward to today. Uh, the, the book I wrote, De Deconstructed, is all about why uh, companies in the construction industry 
are getting away from the model that we, we built America with after WW2, employees, W2 employees, that you, you recruit them, you train them, and you retain them. And, and most people have a, a problem doing that because it costs more. In other words, if you have an employee, that 7.65% that they pay that I match, 15% of every dollar to Social Security plus Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, it, it's, a, it's a labor burden. And, and a lot of companies don't want to do that. And, and, and the problem is there is no enforcement. The Internal Revenue Service refuses to go after workers who are called independent subcontractors. Because if they take that worker to tax court, the guy doesn't have anything. And they know most with a, a Hispanic name, they're going to disappear. They'll be Juan Gonzalez tomorrow and Hector Corral, you know, the next week. And because we have no ID system in the United States, you know, you get a passport, you get a driver's license. But all these people coming across the border, I hope we're giving them an ID and a fingerprint so we know who they are. But we got 11 million people here that we don't know who they are because they flew in on Southwest Airlines, the overstate of Visa. They came across the river, the Rio Grande. And, and, and you know, my whole deal with immigration today is trying to promote the concept that we need to know who's here. Let's issue them a tamper-proof ID. And let's require, if once we've ID, they work for an employer like you who pays and matches taxes. It's simple. And, and it's simple, the- but, and, and you and I have but, talked about this before, and I know one of your pet peeves, and I'm going to ask you to elaborate on this, is that the issue has obviously become politicized. And, and I know that that just makes you crazy. So talk, talk to us about, about that. And how do we, how do we get out of that? This, it's a, it's a never ending cycle. I mean, you've done a good job of kind of, you know, putting a face on it with Hector and explaining how this works. And, um, but how do we get out of this political um, roller coaster that we're on and, and, and we can't seem to get off? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. 20 years ago, we were fighting this issue and, and a good friend of mine in years, Ron Stone. You remember Ron? Very Ron, well. Ron, Ron, Ron did a tech sip, Texas for Sensible Immigration Reform video for me, and I've got it here in my desk that was about ID and tax. It explained everything we just went through. It had pictures of workers being paid in cash, and, and, and he let that get out with his name on it, and he had more people calling him, threatening him, you know, for let me, let me just amnesty. tell the audience for those people who are not Houstonians. Ron Stone um, uh, was a beloved uh, Houston anchor anchor man, a consummate journalist whom I had the pleasure of sitting next to for the very beginning of my career here in Houston as he was leaving. Uh, Ron has since passed away, but he remains an icon in the world of journalism, especially here in Houston. So go ahead now, Stan. You can finish. So, so we probably did that video for $5,000 back in those days. And now I've, I've got this new crew, this rational middle <laughs> immigration group, and we, we're doing almost the identical video for $50,000. <laughs> they will be on YouTube available on the we're rational, middle, on rational middle in a minute, because I, I do want to get to that. But, get, yeah. but I want to get yeah. back to the point that you were making about the politicization of this issue. OK, so go back to that. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we got so close so many times. 2013, uh, the Kennedy-McCain bill passed the Senate with 64 votes. Cornyn voted for it. Of course, Kay Bailey did. And it, it never saw the light of day in, in, in the House. Uh, Boehner uh, I didn't think he could get the votes, which he he, he could have. But, but you know, nobody, nobody in Congress, uh, especially Republicans, are they're, they're all afraid of an opponent in a primary to get to the right of them on immigration. And it all started when Dan Patrick beat David Dewhurst for Lieutenant Governor. You know, Dewhurst was a a good guy. He lost the the primary. You know, 7% of Texans vote in primaries, Linda, which is ridiculous. So, you know, today, all these Republican senators that are running in primaries are being supported by people like John Cornyn and and people, and they all wanna be to the right. Because Trump says you got to be to the right on immigration. A lot of them believe that. But to win a primary in a lot of states with Republican voters, 
you know, you got to be to the right on immigration, especially with the border situation the way it is. I mean, there's a lot of Democrats right now that are probably more to the right than they were before all this stuff happened. So it's 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 it shouldn't be a political issue, uh, but it is. And, and before we get off this, I want to talk about DACA and I want to talk about our high school kids. But uh, but politicians conveniently use this as they need to use it. So, um, OK, you mentioned Rational Middle. Rational Middle is a is an award winning documentary series that you are a part of. And you're going to explain to our audience what your role is in this. Um, yeah. You know, for a long time, and for, for you know, my 20 year journey with all this, uh, you know, on the board of the Great Eastern Partnership and uh, America's Immigration Forum, you know, you no, know, no, no, no. But we we, we we first were going to Washington a lot, uh, flying up there, visiting with uh, the, the Sheila Jackson Lees and the Ted Pose and all our Texas congressmen, Kay Bailey, and we'd have fundraisers. We'd raise a lot of money. You know, uh, Sheila, I'm, I'm proud to say we raised over $100,000 for her at, at an event, and, and, and she tried well, to help us. But it, Sheila Jackson Lee now, congressman. Okay. Yeah, and you can't do that. And, and you know, you need more than just the Democrats to do these things. But we finally realized that you know, or right, and we raised money for Republicans too. And, and 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 but it didn't get us anywhere. You got us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're doing the right thing. We're going to get this done in Congress. But nothing got done. So I said, wait a minute. We got a social media. This was five, six years ago. Social media. Politicians are scared of the power of social media. You know, Facebook wasn't even booming yet, but it is now. So uh, this guy, Gregory Collenberg, had done a Rational Middle series for Shell Oil uh, on, in, on energy and had, had some success educating people on the subject with the talking heads, uh, giving the rational middle of an argument rather than the right or the left and trying to keep it very unbiased. So he said, we can do immigration. It's easy. <laughs> Little did he know how tough it has been. But we now have 12 YouTube videos. If you Google Rational Middle Immigration, you'll see the website. And they have 12 episodes, over 100 podcasts, just like you and I are doing. Lauren Steffi is one of our podcast zores. Lauren is part of the team. He was with the Chronicle for years, works for, uh, writes for Texas Monthly now. And uh, and, it, and it's, we've had about 5 million views, Linda, but we need 50 million. You know, we, we got to get the word out there. And, and the... Uh, what we're really going to concentrate on this coming year are the kids. And I want to share a quick story. I, I shared it with you, but I think it needs to be memorialized in a podcast. You know, we, we always need people and we need good people and, and, and training them, getting them young and training them is the best way. And, and construction is not a sexy career choice. So you, you got to get kids that you know, maybe are mechanically inclined and, and are willing to learn something. You know, most kids say, I don't want to do construction because I don't know anything about it. Well, I mean, how many 17, 18 year olds know anything about anything other than Game Boy? So, you know, we, we started a, a, a very uh, sophisticated internship program with two HISD schools and HCC. And they're poor schools, uh, mostly Latino, African American, east side of town. And we picked with the counselors 25 kids that they didn't think would ever graduate from high school. And that's easy to do in high schools that have a 40 percent dropout rate. I mean, that's hard to believe. Some, But some of our schools do. And, and I'll get to that. So we picked 25 kids and we had the signing ceremony. Uh, Dr. Maldonado from ACC came. All, everybody was. And we had uh, you know, a plan. Go to school in the morning, construction lab in the afternoon taught by one of our 40 year guys that retired that got a teacher certificate. Same way the senior year when the kids graduate, got a job waiting for them, 35,000 a year, college certificate, high school diploma, their dads, I talked to a couple of them were making $12 an hour, raising a family of five, undocumented parents, working in residential home building, putting up tile, sad, 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 all they could get. Of course, $12 an hour, 60 hours a week, so you can make a living. I mean, that's how that worked. but. Anyway, we got, we had that, I think we had 18 left of 25, which is really good. And so getting ready to sign them up. And guess what? Eight are undocumented. Uh, I said, oh, principals, how, how did this happen? Well, we don't ask. You didn't ask. You shouldn't ask. And uh, so we couldn't hire them. They don't have a Social Security number. They're not eligible for DACA because DACA is not signing up any new people. Okay, make matters worse. So I go to the principals. They're wonderful principals. One of them had gone to high school 
at that high school and she was principal after getting her doctorate. Wonderful lady. And I said, so what would you estimate your undocumented population is out of 4,000 kids? They didn't hesitate. Estimate 40%. 1,600 kids. Okay, so where are these kids going to go? Well, first of all, most of them aren't going to graduate because they know they can't get a social security number and get a real job. So they're gonna go and work in restaurants, they're gonna go work in landscaping, they're gonna work in construction. You can walk on any home building site, any commercial building site and, and walk up to the roofer and say, I need a job. And they're gonna say, how old are you? And you're gonna say 18. You're gonna say, you got any ID? I said, well, I got a school ID. And okay, go to work. And uh, you're gonna make 10 bucks an hour eight bucks an hour, whatever. And you're going to work six, and, and you know, there's no, no taxes. And, and, and so that's what those kids do. So they're repeating the cycle of poverty that their parents had. And, 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 I, and I got to thinking about that, Linda, that how many kids in our schools in Texas are like that? And, and, and just to show you an example, uh, I'm on a school board, one of the very finest uh, charter schools. I'm not going to say which one, and, and I asked the principal at a board meeting, and she probably wishes I hadn't asked, how many of our kids are undocumented? And, and she said, we don't know, but I would estimate 20%. So, uh, but please don't tell anybody because if you know Dan Patrick ever finds out we're educating undocumented kids in our charter schools, they'd probably get rid of charter schools. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's sad, it's well, sad. Understand. And, understand. let me ask you. So all, you're, you're doing a great job of, of, you know, kind of really painting the picture of all the, the different elements that are, that are failing. If you could wave a magic wand and fix this situation that you have, you know, dedicated so much of your time and energy and talent to, what are the, what are the, the top three things that you okay. could and, and, and I'm working on these every day. Linda. Number one is DACA. Make DACA permanent, increase the numbers, 18 and under. If you got here before you're 18, you're eligible. That's about 3.2 million kids. And, and recently, there has been some movement in the Senate. I'm not going to use any names, a compromise, border security for higher numbers of DACA, and, and they, they, they couldn't compromise. The Republicans wouldn't budge. The Democrats wouldn't budge. They just died. Well, DACA's that's kind of the, the name of the game with pretty much everything right now. Everything. Okay, so so that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, I, I'm, I've been talking to some people in Congress. We need an executive order from the president that says if you graduate from a Texas or any high school in the United States, and 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 you can pass a background check, that you get a work permit, guest worker permit, not DACA. Just get a social security number so you can go to work at a real job with a career and contribute. This would be for nurses. This would be for EMTs. This would be for construction workers. Right now, all those really bright kids don't have a choice. And that's a sin. That is literally a sin. So that's the second thing I do. And, and I hope the people I'm talking to get with the White House staff and, and demand that. Uh, and, and Biden could do it. Paxton would probably get a stay in a federal court. But that would be political suicide for him to do something that stupid. It's one thing DACA and a path to citizenship. It's another thing to say common sense. We've got a million kids in Texas that can't get a job because they, 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 they don't you know, have an illegal. ID. They don't have any. Yeah. And, and, and that's ridiculous. And we need to know who those kids are now. We don't need to know who they are when we pass a bill five years from now or, ten, or if we ever pass it. The other thing I would definitely do is... Uh, pass another executive order, ID and tax, an adult DACA is all ID and tax is. Because you've got 11 million people here who uh, are contributing. They're working for somebody. They're just getting, not, they're getting, most of them are getting taken advantage of because of their undocumented status. You know, they don't have workman's comp. They don't have safety training. They don't get any kind of benefits. And, and you know, they don't have a driver's license. They're, 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 they won't go to their kids' schools. They won't go to the you know primary care at the, at the hospitals, but most importantly, they won't go to the police. There are people coming across the border, bad people in cartels that locate in neighborhoods where they know they're immune from prosecution. You know, if a, a drug dealer moves in next door to me and I'm undocumented, I'm going to hate it. But am I, I going to go to the police? No. If they've got a stash house, if they've got if they're running prostitution, sexual slavery, no. 
if they get robbed, they they are scared to death. They yeah, won't let go me to ask police. you this: you're you're in the trenches. You're talking to people on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the issue. Um, are are you hearing from? I mean, everything that you just said, you know, to me it makes sense. But there are a lot of people who would have a problem with everything that you just said. You're one, two, and three, okay. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why we've not yet had comprehensive immigration reform is because we cannot find any, any commonality that we, you know, every, all the, 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 the legislators on either side of the aisle can agree they can live with and that their constituents can live with. So what, <laughs> what are they saying to you behind the scenes? And I know, you know, obviously you're not going to name any names, but while let's so let's talk about the Republicans for, for right for this for this particular moment. OK, who, you know, the, the Dan Patrick's of the world who are really pushing back against anything like what you just articulated. Any of them behind the scenes saying there's actually some merit to this, but they don't want to come out publicly and say it. No, I, th- I think everybody's so freaked out by the situation at the border with the Haitians, with all the people, uh, you know, st- the, the the asylum deal. It's a mess down there. I was down for three days with a group of, of business people, and it's a mess. But, you know, we need to put more resources down there. We have good people down there. We can control this if you get enough judges, if you get enough uh, border patrolmen. And, and, you know, we, we you know, putting National Guard or like... I mean that you got to have people that are trained in handling the situation, and and you know there, it breaks my heart the asylum cases, but you know you, you got to draw a line somewhere. Just like with the Haitians, the president drew the line with the Haitians. Said we're not going to mess with this right now. <laughs> You're going back to Haiti. Was that the right thing? I was to just going to ask you. Do you think that was the right decision? I don't know what else he could do, Linda. I mean it, it's so toxic right now, and and and. You know, to me, and I've told everybody this, you aren't going to solve that issue at the border until you ID the 11 million who are here. You need to have their help. These people don't want other people coming across illegally any more so, than we do. I mean, there needs to be a process. Those dots for me. You said you're not going to solve the problem at the border until you ID the 11 million that are already here. Why? What? What is that connection? The people who are here need to go be able to go to the police and report the bad guys when they come in. And and there needs to be a, a controlled, maybe a number of numbers, legal process at the border to let people in. You, you can't, I mean, what we're doing now and what even Trump did is you come in, you got a good asylum case, you get an ankle bracelet, they turn you loose and you come back in a year or two when there's, when there's, when they can hear, hear the case. Most of them don't just come back. They just get lost in the other 11 million. And, 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 they, and it's just they can't get jobs that are worth a damn. They, 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 they just live in poverty and it just aggravates the overall social situation, social structure. Have, of our you, have you been able to get to the to the White House, either with the current administration or the previous one to, to talk with, with anyone, with the president? No, I, you know, I got to GW. You know, he was he was easy to talk to. I, I talked to President Obama. He was easy to talk to Obama. I mean, we were he was on. Well, he did pass DAPA as an executive order. The, for the you know, and he had listening sessions at the White House, and you know he really tried to do the right, and that was the right thing. Of course, they stayed in the court and it died, and 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 then of course he who I will not name, I wasn't going to go take my time, and and Biden, I just don't have the, I mean I'm just about, it's the people, it's social. It, it's grassroots, Linda. It's people picking up the phone, calling Senator Cornyn and say, look, get DAPA, get past DAPA. Past, you hear it over and over and over. That's not happening. People have given up on immigration. They're just waiting to see what happens. And, 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 and I can't give up. I've got all these employees who have families and, and, and I can't give up for the kids. I mean, that broke my heart telling those eight kids we couldn't hire them after they've spent two years and was just so counting on that job, 35,000, you have 150 truck. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, all these things that you got to say, oh my God, I can't do that. How can, how can our elected officials? Well, see, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're dealing at, at a human level. And that's, that's why it's, you know, I, I love that we're having this conversation because you're, you're putting a face on it. I mean, and that's what, you know, what storytelling is. If you can put a face on it and make people feel something, then maybe you can actually spur some, some change and some action. 
um, you're you're dealing on the very human level, and I know that it comes from a from a personal place for you. Um, you kind of glossed over it in the beginning, but I want you to you know because I I know a little bit of the story, but I want you to you know tell our audience ab- about your your family's um, history and their struggles when they first immigrated to this country from Czechoslovakia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we don't have a whole lot of the history. I mean, that oral history passed down from generations. And, and when you're poor, uh, which all my ancestors were, it, it really doesn't get passed down very well. I mean, you're thinking about where am I going to eat, where am I going to sleep? But my, my great grandfather, he was a carpenter in Czechoslovakia and immigrated to um, uh, Galveston, eventually to Yoakum, Texas, uh, where they farmed. And, and they had a good life for, I guess, 20, 30 years. And then my grandfather, who had inherited his father's farm, uh, lost everything in uh, during the Depression and was homeless. And uh, for four years, they lived in a, an old shack that had a dirt floor and an outdoor privy, eating possums, armadillos, and coons. And eventually, when the kids were old enough, the oldest son old enough at 16, he moved to Houston and started hanging sheetrock in 1938. And and, uh, and that was sort of the start of the Merrick companies. And the, uh, they, they all broke up during WW2, but they all learned something in the service. Uh, my oldest uncle John was in the CB, so he learned some good trades. My uncle Bill was a, 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 a Army, Air Corps mechanic, Army mechanic on planes. And my dad, being the youngest, uh, got to stay in the U.S. And he was at the Naval Air Station in Corpus and uh, had been assigned on a work crew to hang sheetrock because that's he was the only one that knew how to do that. And he led the crew and he was they were so impressed that he uh, was asked to run the, the Chiefs Club as a manager. So here's an 18 year old kid graduated from high school when he was 15, didn't know anything, but he convinced the military that he could run a, a team of about 18 or 19. And he did. And he learned about accounting, accountability, security, all these things. But the neat thing about dad being as uneducated as he was, when he turned 20 and mustered out of the Navy, the commander of the base came to him and said, Ralph, you did such a great job. Would you would you run the Officers Club, which is like River Country Club, 220 employees. And the commander said, we're mustering out all the airmen in the entire world out at Naval Air Station, and we want the very best. And they gave him an unlimited budget to do whatever he needed to do. He never had so much fun <laughs> in his life. And then, and then guess what? I came along and messed it all up because mom said, you're coming home at night. And eventually they moved back to Houston. So, but you know, he learned a lot in the military, but we built our company with, with immigrants, whether they're Czech, Polish, German, whatever, Latino. Uh, now we've got Afghans. We're getting a lot of Afghans. We're going to bring into one of our senior VPs is uh, from Iran. He was a naval, naval officer for the Shah and had to, had to defect and speaks Farsi and a brilliant man. And uh, he's really helping uh, Martin Kaminsky at Interfaith and Catholic Charities to play some of these Afghans, which, which they're, they're good workers. They speak English, a lot of them. And, and it, that's so anyway, there's we're, we're, your, your yeah. personal family history is obviously a, you know, a big reason why you're so passionate um, about this, this subject. And, um, and just the, you know, the, the families that, that have become part of your extended family as the employer of, of these immigrants. So as we wrap up, I want you to, to leave, leave us with a couple of things. One, what's your message, if you could say anything to our lawmakers and our president about this situation, what is it that you want to say? Well, I'm gonna devote my energies and hopefully Rational Middle will be able to produce something that will bring tears to your eyes uh, for the kids. And, and, and Dr. Bob Sanborn, who you know well, is, is part of our team. And he feels the same way I do. And we, we just got to get the message out because if we, we're not going to get comprehensive immigration reform, we may never get it, Linda, but we need to take little bites. And, and right now, the most important bite are all the kids that we've t- taken through primary school, middle school and high school, spent billions of dollars educating them and then won't let them get a job. That, that's our future workforce. We as a state and in Texas has more to lose than anybody because we have more undocumented kids in our schools. So we really state. should be we really should be leading the leading the way. Right. No, not blocking the no, way, no, but absolutely. We, and our, our state way. politicians will not even yeah. talk about it. So OK, that brings me to my so. to my last question. What can we do? Are the everyday citizens you talked about picking up the phone and calling and that, you know, people have kind of you know, given up on this whole immigration situation and they're waiting to see what happens. 
So what can you say to get the populace re-energized to do our part to help solve this problem? The, 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 at, at the vote, at the vote, the, the only thing that politicians understand is the vote. And I think, you know, writing them, calling them, emailing them and saying, look, we need to get the kids legal status, either whether I mean, the state can't do it. Uh, it has to be done at a federal level, but it's not going to be done unless Senator Cornyn, Senator Cruz, some of our uh, Democrats uh, in the House and Republicans in the House demand it. Uh, I think if we had, a, 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 you know, a consensus of our elected officials in the U.S. Congress really say, go to the president and say, we need this. Now, you know, there's probably a lot of states that are just sitting back laughing because a lot of states don't like Texas. You know, we offer all this money to bring in these corporate relocations and and then we're not the most popular people in Washington. Uh, some of our elected officials are not. Uh, but but we ha- in California, Linda, they handle it entirely different. And they're giving out driver's license. They're giving, you know, they're they're taking care of their immigrants. They need them for farm workers. I mean, Napa Valley, and I've been there. I've seen it. I mean, it's it's a totally different environment for the undocumented in California. In Texas, it's just I feel for them. It's it's just like well, you know, you are you are being the voice for the voiceless. You know, for those who who are in the shadows and are not able to speak for themselves. And you know, the whole premise and point of this podcast is that all of our voices matter. And um, even when we have a difficult time finding and expressing and raising our voices, um, you know, it's, it's important that, that others will step up to do that. And so uh, I commend you for, for what you Well, thank you. And if your listeners could please, the Rational Middle Immigration, uh, if you like the next video coming out on kids, there's actually number 11 is about kids, but we're going to take it to the next level in 13, 14, and 15. And and uh, gonna, share the videos with friends on Facebook. We're Facebook, we're Facebook to like Rational that. Middle and all of the different things that you've got going on on our on our on our show notes. So everybody will be able to find Good. and support what you're doing. And um, you know, um, this this podcast is about making sure that the, the voices get out there and that those who are being otherized, and certainly our immigrant population. If there's an example of of feeling like you're the other, that is it. And um, I think well, it, be, it, would be, be, it might be good for you to, might be to get with Dr. Bob Sanborn and do a podcast with him if you haven't already. Uh, he'd be to sort of take this one step further from children at risk, their point of view, because they, they work with a lot of uh, you know American born kids with undocumented parents. I mean, those kids are stressing out, too. You know, there's, there's an estimated five million American born kids with undocumented parents, one or more. I mean, and, and to me, that's a no brainer to give those parents some sort of legal status so they can raise our future yeah. workforce. Yeah. You know, that, that, that gets nowhere in Congress too. But anyway, it's it's all about the vote. So we need to figure out a way to okay. let people know. All right, Dan, thank Every- you so much, Dan Merrick. Appreciate you and all you're doing and uh, just be well, right. my friend. You too, keep up your good work, Linda. Thanks. Thank you very much, okay. bye-bye. As I said, we, of course, will link to everything that Stan is involved in so you can follow his efforts for comprehensive immigration reform. Thanks so much, as always, for giving our guest permission to speak and for having the courage to listen to him with an open mind. If you've not yet subscribed to the podcast, what are you waiting for? Please do so. Like, subscribe, share, review. You know what to do. Thanks so much for being a part of the Our Voices Matter podcast audience and family. We appreciate you, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again to our sponsor, BMW of West Houston. There's a special offer for members of the Our Voices Matter podcast community. Just click the link in the show notes, bmwwest.com.